All right, let's take a look at the second part of chapter six. Chapter, the second part of chapter six deals with energy. And energy is the ability to do work. And another way to look at work is work is the ability to move matter in a direction it would not move if it had been left alone. All right. So energy then is the ability to move matter in a direction it would not move if it had been left alone. All right. Now, all organisms require an outside source of energy. No organism makes energy of themselves. Now, if we look at our sources for energy, the sun is our ultimate source of energy. That's where most biological organisms get their energy from. All right. And this is through photosynthesis. All right. So that's our, the major source of the acquisition of biological energy. So us, you know, we don't photosynthesize, but we eat something that did photosynthesize. So we either eat a plant or we eat something that ate that plant. Or we eat something that ate something that ate that plant. Or we eat something that ate something that ate something that ate that plant. And you, you, you get the idea, right? Anyway, the other place that uh, biological organisms get energy from is from actually the Earth. And this is through geothermal energy or inorganic substances, so substances not derived from life. Okay, and the main one here is hydrogen sulfide. So with chemoautotrophs, chemoautotrophs are organisms that obtain energy from chemical bonds. And so what happens in photosynthesis is plants and algae, they take carbon dioxide with water and sunlight energy, and they're gonna make organic molecules. What chemoautotrophs do is they take carbon dioxide and water and they break down an inorganic molecule like hydrogen sulfide. And by doing so, that releases energy. And that's the energy that replaces the sunlight. And they're going to make the organic compounds that way. So carbon dioxide with water with the energy release from another chemical reaction makes those organic molecules. So if the sun were, or I'm sorry, if the earth were to somehow come out of our orbit and just go flying off into outer space, well, we would die and everything that we know of would die. But there are microbes that live at the bottom of the ocean that feed upon hydrogen sulfide. And those areas would still have uh, liquid water because of the geothermal activity of the Earth. So life on this planet will continue. Not, not life uh, with us, but uh, it will continue nonetheless. All right, now we took a look at types of energy. So there are two types of energy. One is kinetic energy, and that is the energy of motion. So these things are like light and heat. Uh, or movement. So like this person diving, they're exhibiting kinetic energy. Next is potential energy. So this is energy stored in the position or the arrangement of matter. All right. So, you know, this person's doing kinetic energy to move up here. This person is exhibiting a lot of potential energy because of all the motion that they could do after the fact. All right. Now, chemical energy is the potential energy of molecules. All right. So if something has a lot of potential energy, uh, we can burn it and uh, it will show off that energy, right? So if we burn paper or wood or stuff like that, a lot of those things have a lot of potential energy. You know, you can't burn rocks. Rocks don't have a whole lot of potential energy, all right? So that's how you determine if something has potential energy. If you burn it, it has a lot. If you can't burn it, it doesn't have a lot. All right, let's look at the laws of thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is the study of energy transformations that occur in a sample of matter. And that sample of matter could be, you know, within a petri dish or a classroom uh, or the planet or the universe. All right. So the first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but can only be changed from one form to another. All right. So all we're doing is energy transformations from one form to another. All right. So what this also in, uh, suggests is that the total amount of energy in the universe is constant. Now, the second law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be changed from one form to another without the loss of usable energy, okay? And usable energy to that system, all right? So in energy, any energy conversion, we're gonna lose some energy as heat. And so uh, the problem with heat is heat is hard to convert back into potential energy, okay? So, you know, if you think about lights, right? Uh, you know, uh, especially if you're talking about incandescent lights, you might notice if you touch a light, it's warm to the touch. And that's because that light uh, is converting electrical energy into light energy, but it's not 100% efficient. It's gonna release some energy as heat. That energy conversions that occur in our body all the time is what maintains our body temperature. So our body temperature is due to the fact that all these chemical reactions are occurring in our body, 
And in those energy conversions, we're going to lose some energy as heat. In fact, a lot of the energy in heat. So only 40% of the energy that's in a glucose molecule is converted directly into ATP, which is then available for use. That is, however, much better than our cars, though. So with cars, uh, it's something like, you know, uh, only 75% of the energy in gasoline. Well, most of it is converted to heat. 75% is converted to heat. Now this gets us to the idea of entropy. Entropy is the amount of disorder in the universe. So uh, heat is the most random form of energy, so that's an increase in disorder. So whenever we have energy conversions, uh, going from one form of energy to another, we're always gonna produce some heat, all right? And so what uh, entropy is telling us is that the entropy of the universe is always increasing because anytime we have energy conversions, we're converting stuff to heat, and then that's lost to the universe. All right, moving on. Let's go to uh, chemical reactions. So just very briefly with uh, chemical reactions uh, in a review, right? So chemical reactions are changes in the chemical composition of matter. So taking uh, the reactants A and B, uh, and then making the products, which are C and D. So remember, reactants are substances that participate in a chemical reaction, and products are the result of chemical reaction. Now let's apply this to energy, okay? So the first are called exergonic reactions. So if you took a chemistry class, they're called exothermic reactions, same thing. So exergonic reactions are energy-releasing chemical reactions. So this would be A plus B produces C plus D, and it's giving off energy, all right? So here, the reactants have more potential energy than the products. So the reactants have more potential energy than the products because energy is given off. So like if you burn something, right, it's gonna release energy. You see that energy, you feel it as heat, and you can see the light that's given off. So when we're talking about reactions that occur metabolically, these are known as catabolic reactions. These are metabolic reactions that break down molecules. In most cases, they release energy, not all the time though. All right. Next are endergonic reactions, and endergonic reactions uh, are energy requiring chemical reactions. So you have to constantly add energy to them in order for the reaction to occur. So this is A plus B plus energy is gonna produce C plus D. So here the reactants have less potential energy than the products. Here's the reactants, products, more potential energy there. And this is what we see with photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, we're gonna take carbon dioxide and water, which both have low potential energy, and we're gonna make glucose out of that, which has high potential energy. So another group of reactions uh, in this is called anabolic reactions. And anabolic reactions uh, are metabolic reactions that synthesize molecules. In most cases, that's gonna require energy. Now there's a third uh, situation that can arise here, and the third situation is called a chemical equilibrium. And this is a chemical reaction that proceeds in both directions at the same rate. So A plus B produces C plus D, but also C plus D can produce A plus B. And in those, there's very little energy in that chemical reaction. And so it depends on what you have more of. If you have more of A and B, it's gonna shift it to produce more C and D. If you have more C and D, it's gonna shift it to produce more A and B. Okay, let's look more now at ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And as I've talked about uh, before, back in chapter three, this is the energy currency of the cell. So whenever we do anything, we're going to expend ATP. So this is shown most of the time, here's our ATP. We're gonna break it down and it's gonna release energy and we're gonna make ADP and a free phosphate ion. You can break this down even further into AMP, monophosphate, and another free phosphate ion and releasing energy. Now, oftentimes with ATP, we do coupled reactions. And so a coupled reaction is where the energy released from an exergonic reaction is used to drive an endergonic reaction. So most reactions that occur in our cells are endergonic, they require energy. So we uh, couple them to the breakdown of ATP. So when ATP is uh, broken down, that's gonna release energy, and that is used to drive an endergonic reaction. So some of the advantages of ATP it's a common energy currency. So all of our cells use ATP for energy. So that's really good because as I mentioned before, anytime we have an energy conversion, even a chemical energy conversion, we're gonna lose some energy as heat. So when ATP is broken down, 
just enough energy is released to fuel most reactions, and so little energy is lost. And lastly, ATP uh, breakdown is coupled. Look at functions of ATP. So let's uh, move to this picture here. So one is chemical work. So over here is chemical work. So it supplies energy to make molecules or to break molecules down. All right. Next is transport work. So transport work, it supplies energy to pump molecules or cross membranes. All right. Uh, and lastly is mechanical work. So it supplies energy for movement. So this is the, the proteins that are found in our muscle cells, and it's going to supply the energy for those proteins to contract.